The Bhagavad Gita Full Audiobook Chapter 1 The War Within Dhritarashtra O Sanjaya, tell me what happened at Kurukshitra, the field of Dharma, where my family and the Pandavas gathered to fight. Sanjaya Having surveyed the forces of the Pandavas arrayed for battle, Prince Duryodhana approached his teacher, Drona, and spoke, O oh my teacher, look at this mighty army of the Pandavas, assembled by your own gifted disciple, Yudhishthira. There are heroic warriors and great archers who are the equals of Bhima and Arjuna. Yuyudana, Virata, the mighty Drupada, Drishtaketu, Shekitana, the valiant king of Kashi, Puruji, Kuntiboya, the great leader Shalbiya, the powerful Yudanianyu, the valiant Uta Maujas, and the son of Subhadra, in addition to the sons of Draupadi. All these command mighty chariots. O best of Brahmins, listen to the names of those who are distinguished among our own forces. Bhishma, Karna, and the victorious Kripa. Ashvatama, Vikarna, and the son of Somadatta. There are many others too, heroes giving up their lives for my sake, all proficient in war and armed with a variety of weapons. Our army is unlimited and commanded by Bhishma. Theirs is small and commanded by Bhima. Let everyone take his proper place and stand firm supporting Bhishma. Then the powerful Bhishma, the grandsire, oldest of all the Kurus, in order to cheer Duryodhana, roared like a lion and blew his conch horn. And after Bhishma, a tremendous noise arose of conches and cow horns and pounding on drums. Then Sri Krishna and Arjuna, who were standing in a mighty chariot yoked with white horses, blew their divine conches. Sri Krishna blew the conch named Panchajanya, and Arjuna blew that called Devadatta. The mighty Bhima blew the huge conch Pandra. Yudhisthira, the king, the son of Kunti, blew the conch Anantavyaya. Nakula and Sahadeva blew their conches as well. Then the king of Kashi, the leading bowman, the great warrior Shikandi Drishtadyumna, Virata, the invincible Satyaki, Drupada, all the sons of Draupadi, and the strong-armed son of Subhadra joined in, and the noise tore throughout the heart of Duryodhana's army. Indeed, the sound was tumultuous, echoing throughout heaven and earth. Then, O Dhritarashtra, lord of the earth, having seen your son's forces set in their places and the fighting about to begin, Arjuna spoke these words to Sri Krishna. O Krishna, drive my chariot between the two armies. I want to see those who desire to fight with me. With whom will this battle be fought? I want to see those assembled to fight for Duryodhana those who seek to please the evil-minded son of Dhritarashtra by engaging in war. Sanjaya Thus Arjuna spoke, and Sri Krishna, driving his splendid chariot between the two armies, facing Bhishma and Drona and all the kings of the earth, said, Arjuna, behold all the Kurus gathered together. And Arjuna, standing between the two armies, saw fathers and grandfathers, teachers, uncles, and brothers, sons and grandsons, in-laws and friends. Seeing his kinsmen established in opposition, Arjuna was overcome by sorrow. Despairing, he spoke these words. O oh, Krishna, I see my own relations here anxious to fight, and my limbs grow weak. My mouth is dry, my body shakes, and my hair is standing on end. My skin burns, and the bow Gandiva has slipped from my hand. I'm unable to stand. 
My mind seems to be whirling. These signs bode evil for us. I do not see that any good can come from killing our relations in battle. O oh Krishna, I have no desire for victory, or for a kingdom or pleasures. Of what use is a kingdom or pleasure or even life, if those for whose sake we desire these things, teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, in-laws, grandsons, and others with family ties, are engaging in this battle, renouncing their wealth and their lives. Even if they were to kill me, I would not want to kill them, not even to become ruler of the three worlds. How much less for the earth alone? O oh Krishna, what satisfaction could we find in killing Dhritarashtra's sons? We would become sinners by slaying these men, even though they are evil. The sons of Dhritarashtra are related to us, therefore we should not kill them. How can we gain happiness by killing members of our own family? Though they are overpowered by greed and see no evil in destroying families or injuring friends, we see those evils. Why shouldn't we turn away from this sin? When a family declines, ancient traditions are destroyed. With them are lost the spiritual foundations for life, and the family loses its sense of unity. Where there is no sense of unity, the women of the family become corrupt, and with the corruption of its women, society is plunged into chaos. Social chaos is hell for the family, and for those who have destroyed the family as well. It disrupts the process of spiritual evolution begun by our ancestors. The timeless spiritual foundations of family and society would be destroyed by these terrible deeds, which violate the unity of life. It is said that those whose family dharma has been destroyed dwell in hell. This is a great sin. We are prepared to kill our own relations out of greed for the pleasures of a kingdom. Better for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, weapons in hand, were to attack me in battle and kill me unarmed and unresisting. Sanjaya, overwhelmed by sorrow, Arjuna spoke these words. And casting away his bow and his arrows, he sat down in his chariot in the middle of the battlefield. Chapter 2 The Illumined Man Sanjaya These are the words that Sri Krishna spoke to the despairing Arjuna, whose eyes were burning with tears of pity and confusion. This despair and weakness in a time of crisis are mean and unworthy of you, Arjuna. How have you fallen to a state so far from the path to liberation? It does not become you to yield to this weakness. Arise with a brave heart and destroy the enemy. Arjuna, how can I ever bring myself to fight against Bhishma and Drona, who are worthy of reverence? How can I, Krishna? Surely it would be better to spend my life begging than to kill these great and worthy souls. If I killed them, every pleasure I found would be tainted. I don't even know which would be better, for us to conquer them or for them to conquer us. The sons of Dhritarashtra have confronted us, but why would we care to live if we killed them? My will is paralyzed, and I am utterly confused. Tell me which is the better path for me. Let me be your disciple. I have fallen at your feet. Give me instruction. What can overcome a sorrow that saps all my vitality? Even power over men and gods or the wealth of an empire seems empty. This is how Arjuna, the great warrior, spoke to Sri Krishna. With the words, O Krishna, I will not fight, he fell silent. As they stood between the two armies, Sri Krishna smiled and replied to Arjuna, who had spoken to despair. You speak sincerely, but your sorrow has no cause. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. There has never been a time when you and I and the kings gathered here have not existed. Nor will there be a time when we will cease to exist. As the same person inhabits the body through childhood, youth, and old age, so too at the time of death he attains another body. The wise are not deluded by these changes. 
When the senses contact sense objects, a person experiences cold or heat, pleasure or pain. These experiences are fleeting, they come and go. Bear them patiently, Arjuna. Those who are not affected by these changes, who are the same in pleasure and pain, are truly wise and fit for immortality. Assert your strength and realize this. The impermanence has no reality. Reality lies in the eternal. Those who have seen the boundary between these two have attained the end of all knowledge. Realize that which pervades the universe and is indestructible. No power can affect this unchanging, imperishable reality. The body is mortal, but he who dwells in the body is immortal and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight in this battle. One man believes he is the slayer, another believes he is the slain. Both are ignorant, there is neither slayer nor slain. You were never born, you will never die. You have never changed, you can never change. Unborn, eternal, immutable, immemorial, you do not die when the body dies. Realizing that which is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and unchanging, how can you slay or cause another to slay? As a man abandons worn-out clothes and acquires new ones, so when the body is worn out, a new one is acquired by the self who lives within. The self cannot be pierced by weapons or burned by fire. Water cannot wet it, nor can the wind dry it. The self cannot be pierced or burned, made wet or dry. It is everlasting and infinite, standing on the motionless foundations of eternity. The self is unmanifested, beyond all thought, beyond all change. Knowing this, you should not grieve. O oh, mighty Arjuna, even if you believe the self to be subject to birth and death, you should not grieve. Death is inevitable for the living, Birth is inevitable for the dead. Since these are unavoidable, you should not sorrow. Every creature is unmanifested at first and then attains manifestation. When its end has come, it once again becomes unmanifested. What is there to lament in this? The glory of the self is beheld by a few, and a few describe it. A few listen, but many without understanding. The self of all beings, living within the body, is eternal and cannot be harmed. Therefore do not grieve. Considering your dharma, you should not vacillate. For a warrior, nothing is higher than a war against evil. The warrior confronted with such a war should be pleased, Arjuna for it comes as an open gate to heaven. But if you do not participate in this battle against evil, you will incur sin, violating your dharma and your honor. The story of your dishonor will be repeated endlessly, and for a man of honor, dishonor is worse than death. These brave warriors will think you have withdrawn from battle out of fear, and those who formerly esteemed you will treat you with disrespect. Your enemies will ridicule your strength and say things that should not be said. What could be more painful than this? Death means the attainment of heaven. Victory means the enjoyment of the earth. Therefore rise up, Arjuna, resolve to fight. Having made yourself alike in pain and pleasure, profit and loss, victory and defeat, engage in this great battle and you will be freed from sin. You have heard the intellectual explanation of Sankhya, Arjuna. Now listen to the principles of yoga. By practicing these, you can break through the bonds of karma. On this path, effort never goes to waste, and there is no failure. Even a little effort towards spiritual awareness will protect you from the greatest fear. Those who follow this path resolving deep within themselves to seek me alone, attains singleness of purpose. 
For those who lack resolution, the decisions of life are many-branched and endless. There are ignorant people who speak flowery words and take delight in the letter of the law, saying that there is nothing else. Their hearts are full of selfish desires, Arjuna. Their idea of heaven is their own enjoyment, and the aim of all their activities is pleasure and power. The fruit of their action is continual rebirth. Those whose minds are swept away by the pursuit of pleasure and power are incapable of following the supreme goal and will not attain samadhi. The scriptures describe the three gunas, but you should be free from the action of the gunas, established in eternal truth, self-controlled, without any sense of duality or the desire to acquire and hoard. Just as a reservoir is of little use when the whole countryside is flooded, scriptures are of little use to the ill mind man or woman who sees the Lord everywhere. You have the right to work, but never to the fruit of the work. You should never engage in action for the sake of reward, nor should you long for inaction. Perform work in this world, Arjuna, as a man established within himself, without selfish attachments and alike in success and defeat. For yoga is perfect evenness of mind. Seek refuge in the attitude of detachment, and you will amass the wealth of spiritual awareness. Those who are motivated only by desire for the fruits of action are miserable, for they are constantly anxious about the results of what they do. When consciousness is unified, however, all vain and anxiety is left behind. There is no cause for worry whether things go well or ill. Therefore, devote yourself to the disciples of yoga, for yoga is skill in action. The wise unify their consciousness and abandon attachment to the fruits of action, which binds a person to continual rebirth. Thus, they attain a state beyond all evil. When your mind has overcome the confusion of duality, you will attain the state of holy indifference to things you hear and things you have heard. When you are unmoved by the confusion of ideas, and your mind is completely unified, in deep samadhi, you will attain the state of perfect yoga. Arjuna, tell me of those who live established in wisdom, ever aware of the self, O Krishna. How do they talk? How sit? How move about? They live in wisdom, who see themselves in all and all in them who have renounced every selfish desire and sense-craving tormenting the heart. Neither agitated by grief nor hankering after pleasure, they live free from lust and fear and anger. Established in meditation, they are truly wise. Fettered no more by selfish attachments, they are neither elated by good fortune nor depressed by bad. Such are the seers, even as a tortoise draws in its limbs, the wise can draw in their senses at will. Aspirants abstain from sense pleasures, but they still crave for them. These cravings all disappear when they see the highest goal. Even of those who tread the path, the stormy senses can sweep off the mind. They live in wisdom who subdue their senses and keep their minds ever absorbed in me. When you keep thinking about sense objects, attachment comes. Attachment breeds desire, the lust of possession that burns to anger. Anger clouds the judgment. You can no longer learn from past mistakes. Lost is the power to choose between what is wise and what is unwise. And your life is utter waste. But when you move amidst to the world of sense, free from attachment and aversion alike, there comes the peace in which all sorrows end, and you live in the wisdom of the self. The disunited mind is far from wise. How can it meditate? How be at peace? 
When you know no peace, how can you know joy? When you let your mind follow the call of the senses, they carry away your better judgment as storms drive a boat off its charted course on the sea. Use all your power to free the senses from attachment and aversion alike, and live in the full wisdom of the self. Such a sage awakes to light in the night of all creatures. That which the world calls day is the night of ignorance to the wise. As rivers flow into the ocean but cannot make the vast ocean overflow, so flow the senses of the sense world into the sea of peace that is the sage. But this is not so with the desirer of desires. They are forever free who renounce all selfish desires and break away from the ego cage of I, me, and mine to be united with the Lord. This is the supreme state. Attain to this and pass from death to immortality. Chapter 3. Selfless Service O Krishna, you have said that knowledge is greater than action. Why then do you ask me to wage this terrible war? Your advice seems inconsistent. Give me one path to follow to the supreme good. At the beginning of time, I declared two paths for the pure heart. Jnana Yoga, the contemplated path of spiritual wisdom, and Karma Yoga, the active path of selfless service. He who shirks action does not attain freedom. No one can gain perfection by abstaining from work. Indeed, there is no one who rests for even an instant. Every creature is driven to action by his own nature. Those who abstain from action while allowing the mind to dwell on sensual pleasure cannot be called sincere spiritual aspirants. But they excel who control their senses through the mind, using them for selfless service. Fulfill all your desires. Action is better than inaction. Even to maintain your body, Arjuna, you are obliged to act. Selfish action imprisons the world. Act selflessly, without any thought of personal profit. At the beginning, mankind and the obligation of selfless service were created together. Through selfless service, you will always be fruitful and find the fulfillment of your desires. This is the promise of the Creator. Honor and cherish the Divas as they honor and cherish you. Through this honor and love, you will attain the supreme good. All human desires are fulfilled by the Divas, who are pleased by selfless service. But anyone who enjoys the things given by the Divas without offering selfless acts in return is a thief. The spiritually minded, who eat in the spirit of service, are freed from all their sins. But the selfish, who prepare food for their own satisfaction, eat sin. Living creatures are nourished by food, and food is nourished by rain. Rain itself is the water of life, which comes from selfless worship and service. Every selfless act, Arjuna, is born from Brahman, the eternal, infinite Godhead. He is present in every act of service. All life turns on this law, O Arjuna. Whoever violates it, indulging his senses for his own pleasure and ignoring the needs of others, has wasted his life. But those who realize the self are always satisfied. Having found the source of joy and fulfillment, they no longer seek happiness from the external world. They have nothing to gain or lose by any action. Neither people nor things can affect their security. Strive constantly to serve the welfare of the world. By devotion to selfless work, one attains the supreme goal of life. Do your work with the welfare of others, always in mind. It was by such work that Yanaka attained perfection. Others, too, have followed this path. What the outstanding person does, others will try to do. The standards such people create will be followed by the whole world. There is nothing in the three worlds for me to gain, Arjuna, nor is there anything I do not have. I continue to act, but I am not driven by any need of my own. 
If I ever refrained from continuous work, everyone would immediately follow my example. If I stopped working, I would be the cause of cosmic chaos. And finally, of the destruction of this world and these people. The ignorant work for their own profit, Arjuna. The wise work for the welfare of the world, without thought for themselves. By abstaining from work, you will confuse the ignorant who are engrossed in their actions. Perform all work carefully, guided by compassion. All actions are performed by the gunas of Prakriti. Deluded by his identification with the ego, a person thinks, I am the doer. But the illumined man or woman understands the domain of the gunas and is not attached. Such people know that the gunas interact with each other. They do not claim to be the doer. Those who are deluded by the operation of the gunas become attached to the results of their action. Those who understand these truths should not unsettle the ignorant. Performing all actions for my sake, completely absorbed in the self, and without expectations, fight, but stay free from the fever of the ego. Those who live in accordance with these divine laws without complaining, firmly established in faith, are released from karma. Those who violate these laws, criticizing and complaining, are utterly deluded and are the cause of their own suffering. Even a wise man acts within the limitations of his own nature. Every creature is subject to prakriti. What is the use of repression? The senses have been conditioned by attraction to the pleasant and aversion to the unpleasant. Do not be ruled by them. They are obstacles in your path. It is better to strive in one's own dharma than to succeed in the dharma of another. Nothing is ever lost in following one's own dharma, but competition in another's dharma breeds fear and insecurity. What is the force that binds us to selfish deeds, O Krishna? What power moves us, even against our own will, as if forcing us? It is selfish desire and anger arising from the guna of rajas. These are the appetites and evils which threaten a person in this life. Just as a fire is covered by smoke and a mirror is obscured by dust, just as the embryo rests deep within the womb, knowledge is hidden by selfish desire. Hidden, Arjuna, by this unquenchable fire for self-satisfaction, the inveterate enemy of the wise. Selfish desire is found in the senses, mind, and intellect misleading them and burying the understanding in delusion. Fight with all your strength, Arjuna. Controlling your senses, conquer your enemy, the destroyer of knowledge and realization. The senses are higher than the body, the mind higher than the senses. Above the mind is the intellect, and above the intellect is the Atman. Thus, knowing that which is supreme, let the Atman rule the ego. Use your mighty arms to slay the fierce enemy that is selfish desire. Chapter 4. Wisdom in Action Sri Krishna I told this eternal secret to Vivasvat. Vivasvat tat Manu, and Manu tat Ikshvaku. Thus, Arjuna, eminent sages, received knowledge of yoga in a continuous tradition. But through time, the practice of yoga was lost in the world. The secret of these teachings is profound. I have explained them to you today because you are my friend and devotee. Arjuna, you were born much after Vivasvat. He lived very long ago. Why do you say that you taught this yoga in the beginning? Sri Krishna, you and I have passed through many births, Arjuna. You have forgotten, but I remember them all. My true being is unborn and changeless. I am the Lord who dwells in every creature. Through the power of my own maya, I manifest myself in a finite form. Whenever dharma declines and the purpose of life is forgotten, I manifest myself on earth. 
I am born in every age to protect the good, to destroy evil, and to reestablish Dharma. He who knows me as his own divine self breaks through the belief that he is the body and is not reborn as a separate creature. Such a one, Arjuna, is united with me. Delivered from selfish attachment, fear and anger, filled with me, surrendering themselves to me, purified in the fire of my being, many have reached the state of unity in me. As men approach me, so I receive them. All paths, Arjuna, lead to me. Those desiring success in their actions worship the gods. Through action in the world of mortals, their desires are quickly fulfilled. The distinctions of caste, guna, and karma have come from me. I am their cause, but I myself am changeless and beyond all action. Actions do not cling to me because I am not attached to their results. Those who understand this and practice it live in freedom. Knowing this truth, aspirants desiring liberation in ancient times engaged in action. You too can do the same, pursuing an active life in the manner of those ancient sages. What is action and what is inaction? This question has confused the greatest sages. I will give you the secret of action, with which you can free yourself from bondage. The true nature of action is difficult to grasp. You must understand what is action and what is inaction, and what kind of actions should be avoided. The wise see that there is action in the midst of inaction and inaction in the midst of action. Their consciousness is unified, and every act is done with complete awareness. The awakened sages call a person wise when all his undertakings are free from anxiety about results. All his selfish desires have been consumed in the fire of knowledge. The wise, ever satisfied, have abandoned all external supports. Their security is unaffected by the results of their action. Even while acting, they really do nothing at all. Free from expectations and from all sense of possession, with mind and body firmly controlled by the self, they do not incur sin by the performance of physical action. They live in freedom who have gone beyond the dualities of life. Competing with no one, they are alike in success and failure and content with whatever comes to them. They are free without selfish attachments. Their minds are fixed in knowledge. They perform all work in the spirit of service and their karma is dissolved. The process of offering is Brahman. That which is offered is Brahman. Brahman offers the sacrifice in the fire of Brahman. Brahman is attained by those who see Brahman in every action. Some aspirants offer material sacrifices to the gods. Others offer selfless service as a sacrifice in the fire of Brahman. Some renounce all enjoyment of the senses, sacrificing them in the fire of self-restraint. Others partake of sense objects, but offer them in service through the fire of the senses. Some offer the workings of the senses and the vital forces through the fire of self-control, kindled in the path of knowledge. Some offer wealth, others offer sense-restraint and suffering. Some take vows and offer knowledge and study of the scriptures, and some make the offering of meditation. Some offer the forces of vitality, regulating their inhalation and exhalation, and thus gain control over these forces. Others offer the forces of vitality through restraint of their senses. All these understand the meaning of service and will be cleansed of their impurities. True sustenance is in service, and through it a man or woman reaches the eternal Brahman. But those who do not seek to serve are without a home in this world. 
Arjuna, how can they be at home in any world to come? These offerings are born of work, and each guides mankind along a path to Brahman. Understanding this, you will attain liberation. The offering of wisdom is better than any material offering, Arjuna, for the goal of all work is spiritual wisdom. Approach someone who has realized the purpose of life and question him with reverence and devotion. He will instruct you in this wisdom. Once you attain it, you will never again be deluded. You will see all creatures in the self and all in me. Even if you were the most sinful of sinners, Arjuna, you could cross beyond all sin by the raft of spiritual wisdom. As the heat of a fire reduces wood to ashes, the fire of knowledge burns to ashes all karma. Nothing in this world purifies like spiritual wisdom. It is the perfection achieved in time through the path of yoga, the path which leads to the self within. Those who take wisdom as their highest goal, whose faith is deep and whose senses are trained, attain wisdom quickly and enter into perfect peace. But the ignorant, indecisive, and lacking in faith waste their lives. They can never be happy in this world or any other. Those established in the self have renounced selfish attachments to their actions and cut through doubts with spiritual wisdom. They act in freedom. Arjuna, cut through this doubt in your heart with the sword of spiritual wisdom. Arise, take up the path of yoga. Chapter 5. Renounce and Rejoice Arjuna O Krishna, you have recommended both the path of selfless action and sannyasa, the path of renunciation of action. Tell me definitely which is better. Sri Krishna Both renunciation of action and the selfless performance of action lead to the supreme goal. But the path of action is better than renunciation. Those who have attained perfect renunciation are free from any sense of duality. They are unaffected by likes and dislikes, Arjuna, and are free from the bondage of self-will. The immature think that knowledge and action are different, but the wise see them as the same. The person who is established in one path will attain the rewards of both. The goal of knowledge and the goal of service are the same, those who fail to see this are blind. Perfect renunciation is difficult to attain without performing action, but the wise following the path of selfless service quickly reach Brahman. Those who follow the path of service, who have completely purified themselves and conquered their senses and self-will, see the self in all creatures and are untouched by any action they perform. Those who know this truth, whose consciousness is unified, Think always, I am not the doer. While seeing or hearing, touching or smelling, eating, moving about, or sleeping, breathing or speaking, letting go or holding on, even opening or closing the eyes, they understand that these are only the movements of the senses among sense objects. Those who surrender to Brahman, all selfish attachments, are like the leaf of a lotus floating clean and dry in water. Sin cannot touch them. Renouncing their selfish attachments, those who follow the path of service work with body, senses, and mind for the sake of self-purification. Those whose consciousness is unified abandon all attachment to the results of action and attain supreme peace. But those whose desires are fragmented, who are selfishly attached to the results of their work, are bound in everything they do. Those who renounce attachment in all their deeds live content in the city of nine gates, the body as its master. They are not driven to act, nor do they involve others in action. Neither the sense of acting, nor actions, nor the connection of cause and effect comes from the lord of this world. These three arise from nature. The lord does not partake in the good and evil deeds of any person. Judgment is clouded when wisdom is obscured by ignorance. 
but ignorance is destroyed by knowledge of the self within. The light of this knowledge shines like the sun, revealing the supreme Brahman. Those who cast off sin through this knowledge, absorbed in the Lord and established in him as their one goal and refuge, are not reborn as separate creatures. Those who possess this wisdom have equal regard for all. They see the same self in a spiritual aspirant and an outcast, in an elephant, a cow, and a dog. Such people have mastered life. With even mind they rest in Brahman, who is perfect and is everywhere the same. They are not elated by good fortune, nor depressed by bad. With mind established in Brahman, they are free from delusion. Not dependent on any external support, they realize the joy of spiritual awareness. With consciousness unified through meditation, they live in abiding joy. Pleasures conceived in the world of the senses have a beginning and an end and give birth to misery, Arjuna. The wise do not look for happiness in them, but those who overcome the impulses of lust and anger which arise in the body are made whole and live in joy. They find their joy, their rest, and their light completely within themselves. United with the Lord, they attain nirvana in Brahman. Healed of their sins and conflict, working for the good of all beings, the holy sages attain nirvana in Brahman. Free from anger and selfish desire, unified in mind, those who follow the path of yoga and realize the self are established forever in that supreme state. Closing their eyes, steadying their breath, and focusing their attention on the center of spiritual consciousness, the wise master their senses, mind, and intellect through meditation. Self-realization is their only goal. Freed from selfish desire, fear, and anger, they live in freedom always. Knowing me as the friend of all creatures, the lord of the universe, the end of all offerings and all spiritual disciplines, they attain eternal peace. Chapter 6. The Practice of Meditation Sri Krishna It is not those who lack energy or refrain from action, but those who work without expectation of reward who attain the goal of meditation. Theirs is true renunciation. Therefore, Arjuna, you should understand that renunciation and the performance of selfless service are the same. Those who cannot renounce attachment to the results of their work are far from the path. For aspirants who want to climb the mountain of spiritual awareness, the path is selfless work. For those who have ascended to yoga, the path is stillness and peace. When a person has freed himself from attachment to the results of work, and from desires for the enjoyment of sense objects, he ascends to the united state. Reshape yourself through the power of your will. Never let yourself be degraded by self-will. The will is the only friend of the self, and the will is the only enemy of the self. To those who have conquered themselves, the will is a friend, but it is the enemy of those who have not found the self within them. The supreme reality stands revealed in the consciousness of those who have conquered themselves. They live in peace, alike in cold and heat, pleasure and pain, praise and blame. They are completely fulfilled by spiritual wisdom and self-realization. Having conquered their senses, they have climbed to the summit of human consciousness. To such people a clod of dirt, a stone, and gold are the same. They are equally disposed to family, enemies, and friends, to those who support them and those who are hostile, to the good and the evil alike. Because they are impartial, they rise to great heights. Those who aspire to the state of yoga should seek the self in inner solitude through meditation. With body and mind controlled, they should constantly practice one-pointedness, free from expectations and attachment to material possessions. Select a clean spot, neither too high nor too low, and seat yourself firmly on a cloth, a deerskin, and kusha grass. 
Then, once seated, strive to still your thoughts. Make your mind one-pointed in meditation, and your heart will be purified. Hold your body, head, and neck firmly in a straight line, and keep your eyes from wandering. With all fears dissolved into the peace of the self and all desires dedicated to Brahman, controlling the mind and fixing it on me, sit in meditation with me as your only goal. With senses and mind constantly controlled through meditation, united with the self within, an aspirant attains nirvana, the state of abiding joy and peace in me. Arjuna, those who eat too much or eat too little, who sleep too much or sleep too little, will not succeed in meditation. But those who are temperate in eating and sleeping, work and recreation, will come to the end of sorrow through meditation. Through constant effort, they learn to withdraw the mind from selfish cravings and absorb it in the self. Thus they attain the state of union. When meditation is mastered, the mind is unwavering like the flame of a lamp in a windless place. In the still mind, in the depths of meditation, the self reveals itself. Beholding the self by means of the self, an aspirant knows the joy and peace of complete fulfillment. Having attained that abiding joy beyond the senses, revealed in the stilled mind, he never swerves from the eternal truth. He desires nothing else and cannot be shaken by the heaviest burden of sorrow. The practice of meditation frees one from all affliction. This is the path of yoga. Follow it with determination and sustained enthusiasm. Renouncing wholeheartedly all selfish desires and expectations, use your will to control the senses. Little by little, through patience and repeated effort, the mind will become stilled in the self. Wherever the mind wanders, restless and diffuse in its search for satisfaction without, lead it within. Train it to rest in the self. Abiding joy comes to those who still the mind. Freeing themselves from the taint of self-will, with their consciousness unified, they become one with Brahman. The infinite joy of touching Brahman is easily attained by those who are free from the burden of evil and established within themselves. They see the self in every creature and all creation in the self. With consciousness unified through meditation, they see everything with an equal eye. I am ever present to those who have realized me in every creature. Seeing all life as my manifestation, they are never separated from me. They worship me in the hearts of all, and all their actions proceed from me. Wherever they may live, they abide in me. When a person responds to the joys and sorrows of others as if they were his own, he has attained the highest state of spiritual union. Arjuna O Krishna, the stillness of divine union which you describe is beyond my comprehension. How can the mind which is so restless attain lasting peace? Krishna, the mind is restless, turbulent, powerful, violent. Trying to control it is like trying to tame the wind. Sri Krishna, it is true that the mind is restless and difficult to control, but it can be conquered, Arjuna, through regular practice and detachment. Those who lack self-control will find it difficult to progress in meditation, but those who are self-controlled, striving earnestly through the right means, will attain the goal. Krishna, what happens to the man who has faith but who lacks self-control and wanders from the path, not attaining success in yoga? If a man becomes deluded on the spiritual path, will he lose the support of both worlds, like a cloud scattered in the sky? 
Krishna, you can dispel all doubts. Remove this doubt which binds me. Arjuna, my son, such a person will not be destroyed. No one who does good work will ever come to a bad end, either here or in the world to come. When such people die, they go to other realms where the righteous live. They dwell there for countless years and then are reborn into a home which is pure and prosperous. Or they may be born into a family where meditation is practiced. To be born into such a family is extremely rare. The wisdom they have acquired in previous lives will be reawakened, Arjuna, and they will strive even harder for self-realization. Indeed, they will be driven on by the strength of their past disciplines. Even one who inquires after the practice of meditation rises above those who simply perform rituals. Through constant effort over many lifetimes, a person becomes purified of all selfish desires and attains the supreme goal of life. Meditation is superior to severe asceticism and the path of knowledge. It is also superior to selfless service. May you attain the goal of meditation, Arjuna. Even among those who meditate, that man or woman who worships me with perfect faith completely absorbed in me, is the most firmly established in yoga. Chapter 7. Wisdom from Realization Sri Krishna With your mind intent on me, Arjuna, discipline yourself with the practice of yoga. Depend on me completely. Listen, and I will dispel all your doubts. You will come to know me fully and be united with me. I will give you both jnana and vijnana. When both these are realized, there is nothing more you need to know. One person in many thousands may seek perfection, yet of these only a few reach the goal and come to realize me. Earth, water, fire, air, akasha, mind, intellect, and ego, these are the eight divisions of my prakriti. But beyond this, I have another, higher nature, Arjuna. It supports the whole universe and is the source of life in all beings. In these two aspects of my nature is the womb of all creation. The birth and dissolution of the cosmos itself takes place in me. There is nothing that exists separate from me, Arjuna. The entire universe is suspended from me as my necklace of jewels. Arjuna, I am the taste of pure water and the radiance of the sun and moon. I am the sacred word and the sound heard in air, and the courage of human beings. I am the sweet fragrance in the earth and the radiance of fire. I am the life in every creature and the striving of the spiritual aspirant. My eternal seed, Arjuna, is to be found in every creature. I am the power of discrimination in those who are intelligent, and the glory of the noble. In those who are strong, I am strength, free from passion and selfish attachment. I am desire itself, if that desire is in harmony with the purpose of life. The states of sattva, rajas, and tamas come from me, but I am not in them. These three gunas deceive the world. People fail to look beyond them to me, supreme and imperishable. The three gunas make up my divine maya, difficult to overcome. But they cross over this maya. Performing evil deeds, they have no devotion to me. Having lost all discrimination, they follow the way of their lower nature. Good people come to worship me for different reasons. Some come to the spiritual life because of suffering, some in order to understand life. Some come through a desire to achieve life's purpose. And some come who are men and women of wisdom. Unwavering in devotion always united with me, the man or woman of wisdom surpasses all the others. 
To them I am the dearest beloved, and they are very dear to me. All those who follow the spiritual path are blessed. But the wise who are always established in union, for whom there is no higher goal than me, may be regarded as my very self. After many births, the wise seek refuge in me, seeing me everywhere and in everything. Such great souls are very rare. There are others whose discrimination is misled by many such desires. Following their own nature, they worship lower gods, practicing various rites. When a person is devoted to something with complete faith, I unify his faith in that. Then, when his faith is completely unified, he gains the object of his devotion. In this way, every desire is fulfilled by me. Those whose understanding is small attain only transient satisfaction. Those who worship the gods go to the gods, but my devotees come to me. Through lack of understanding, people believe that I, the unmanifest, have entered into some form. They fail to realize my true nature, which transcends birth and death. Few see through the veil of Maya. The world, deluded, does not know that I am without birth and changeless. I know everything about the past, the present, and the future, Arjuna. But there is no one who knows me completely. Delusion arises from the duality of attraction and aversion, Arjuna. Every creature is deluded by these from birth. But those who have freed themselves from all wrongdoing are firmly established in worship of me. Their actions are pure, and they are free from the delusion caused by pairs of the opposites. Those who take refuge in me, striving for liberation from old age and death, come to know Brahman, the self, and the nature of all action. Those who see me ruling the cosmos, who see me in the Adibhuta, the Adidaiva, and the Aduyajna, are conscious of me even at the time of death. Chapter 8 The Eternal Godhead Arjuna O Krishna, what is Brahman? And what is the nature of action? What is the Adhyatma, the Adibhuta, the Adidaiva? What is the Adhyana? the supreme sacrifice, and how is it to be offered? How are the self-controlled united with you at the time of death? Sri Krishna My highest nature, the imperishable Brahman, gives every creature its existence and lives in every creature as Adhyatma. My action is creation and the bringing forth of creatures. The Adi Buddha is perishable body. The Adi Daiva is Purusha, eternal spirit. The Adi Yana, the supreme sacrifice, is made to me as the Lord within you. Those who remember me at the time of death will come to me. Do not doubt this. Whatever occupies the mind at the time of death determines the destination of the dying. Always they will tend toward that state of being. Therefore, remember me at all times and fight on. With your heart and mind intent on me, you will surely come to me. When you make your mind one-pointed through regular practice of meditation, you will find the supreme glory of the Lord. The Lord is the supreme poet, the first cause, the sovereign ruler, subtler than the tiniest particle, the support of all, inconceivable, bright as the sun, beyond a darkness. Remembering him in this way at the time of death, through devotion 
and the power of meditation. With your mind completely stilled and your concentration fixed in the center of spiritual awareness between the eyebrows, you will realize the Supreme Lord. I will tell you briefly of the eternal state all scriptures affirm, which can be entered only by those who are self-controlled and free from selfish passions. Those whose lives are dedicated to Brahman attain this supreme goal. Remembering me at the time of death, close down the doors of the senses and place the mind in the heart. Then, while absorbed in meditation, focus all energy upwards to the head, repeating in this state the divine name, the syllable Om that represents the changeless Brahman. You will go forth from the body and attain the supreme goal. I am easily attained by the person who always remembers me and is attached to nothing else. Such a person is a true yogi, Arjuna. Great souls make their lives perfect and discover me. They are freed from mortality and the suffering of this separate existence. Every creature in the universe is subject to rebirth, Arjuna, except the one who is united with me. Those who understand the cosmic laws know that the day of Brahma ends after a thousand yugas, and the night of Brahma ends after a thousand yugas. When the day of Brahma dawns, Forms are brought forth from the unmanifest. When the night of Brahma comes, these forms merge in the formless again. This multitude of beings is created and destroyed again and again in the succeeding days and nights of Brahma. But beyond this formless state there is another unmanifested reality which is eternal and is not dissolved when the cosmos is destroyed. Those who realize life's supreme goal know that I am unmanifested and unchanging. Having come home to me, they never return to separate existence. This supreme Lord who pervades all existence the true self of all creatures, may be realized through undivided love. There are two paths, Arjuna, which the soul may follow at the time of death. One leads to rebirth and the other to liberation. The six months of the northern path of the sun, the path of light, of fire, of day, of the bright fortnight, leads knowers of Brahman to the supreme goal. The six months of the southern path of the sun, the path of smoke, of night, of the dark fortnight, leads other souls to the light of the moon and to rebirth. These two paths, the light and the dark, are said to be eternal, leading some to liberation and others to rebirth. Once you have known these two paths, Arjuna, you can never be deluded again. Attain this knowledge through perseverance in yoga. There is merit in studying the scriptures, in selfless service, austerity, and giving. But the practice of meditation carries you beyond all these to the supreme abode of the highest Lord. Chapter 9, The Royal Path, Sri Krishna Because of your faith, I shall tell you the most profound secrets. Obtaining both jnana and vijnana, 
you will be free from all evil. This royal knowledge, this royal secret, is the greatest purifier. Righteous and imperishable, it is a joy to practice and can be directly experienced. But those who have not faith in the supreme law of life do not find me, Arjuna. They return to the world, passing from death to death. I pervade the entire universe in my unmanifested form. All creatures find their existence in me, but I am not limited by them. Behold my divine mystery. These creatures do not really dwell in me, and though I bring them forth and support them, I am not confined within them. They move in me as the winds move in every direction in space. At the end of the eon, these creatures return to unmanifested matter. At the beginning of the next cycle, I send them forth again. Controlling my prakriti, again and again, I bring forth these myriad forms and subject them to the laws of prakriti. None of these actions bind me, Arjuna. I am unattached to them, so they do not disturb my nature. Under my watchful eye, the laws of nature take their course. Thus is the world set in motion. Thus the animate and the inanimate are created. The foolish do not look beyond physical appearances to see my true nature as the Lord of all creation. The knowledge of such deluded people is empty. Their lives are fraught with disaster and evil, and their work and hopes are all in vain. But truly great souls seek my divine nature. They worship me with a one-pointed mind, having realized that I am the eternal source of all. Constantly striving, they make firm their resolve and worship me without wavering. Full of devotion, they sing of my divine glory. Others follow the path of Nyana, spiritual wisdom. They see that where there is one, that one is me. Where there are many, all are me. They see my face everywhere. I am the ritual and the sacrifice. I am true medicine and the mantram. I am the offering and the fire which consumes it, and he to whom it is offered. I am the father and mother of this universe, and its grandfather too. I am its entire support. I am the sum of all knowledge, the purifier, the syllable Om. I am the sacred scriptures, the Rik, Yajur, and Sama Vedas. I am the goal of life, the Lord and support of all, the inner witness, the abode of all. I am the only refuge, the one true friend. I am the beginning, the staying, and the end of creation. I am the womb, an eternal seed. I am heat. I give and withhold the rain. I am immortality and I am death. I am what is and what is not. Those who follow the rituals given in the Vedas, who offer sacrifices and take soma, free themselves from evil and attain the vast heaven of the gods, where they enjoy celestial pleasures. When they have enjoyed these fully, their merit is exhausted, 
and they return to this land of death. Thus observing Vedic rituals, but caught in an endless chain of desires, they come and go. Those who worship me and meditate on me constantly, without any other thought, I will provide for all their needs. Those who worship other gods with faith and devotion also worship me, Arjuna, even if they do not observe the usual forms. I am the object of all worship, its enjoyer and lord. But those who fail to realize my true nature must be reborn. Those who worship the devas will go to the realm of the devas. Those who worship their ancestors will be united with them after death. Those who worship phantoms will become phantoms, but my devotees will come to me. Whatever I am offered in devotion with a pure heart, a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water, I partake of that love offering. Whatever you do, make it an offering to me. The food you eat, the sacrifices you make, the help you give, even your suffering. In this way you will be freed from the bondage of karma, and from its results both pleasant and painful. Then, firm in renunciation and yoga, with your heart free you will come to me. I look upon all creatures equally. None are less dear to me, and none more dear. But those who worship me with love live in me, and I come to life in them. Even a sinner becomes holy when he worships me alone with firm resolve. Quickly his soul conforms to dharma, and he attains to boundless peace. Never forget this, Arjuna. No one who is devoted to me will ever come to harm. All those who take refuge in me, whatever their birth, race, sex, or caste, will attain the supreme goal. This realization can be attained even by those whom society scorns. Kings and sages, too, seek this goal with devotion. Therefore, having been born in this transient and forlorn world, give all your love to me. Fill your mind with me, love me, serve me, worship me always. Seeking me in your heart, you will at last be united with me. Chapter 10 Divine Splendor Sri Krishna. Listen further, Arjuna, to my supreme teaching, which gives you such joy. Desiring your welfare, O oh, strong armed warrior, I will tell you more. Neither gods nor sages know my origin. For I am the source from which the gods and sages come. Whoever knows me as the Lord of all creation, without birth or beginning, knows the truth and frees himself from all evil. Discrimination, wisdom, understanding, forgiveness, truth, self-control, and peace of mind, pleasure and pain, birth and death, fear and courage, honor and infamy, nonviolence, charity, equanimity, contentment, and perseverance in spiritual disciplines. All the different qualities found in living creatures have their source in me. The seven great sages and the four ancient ancestors were born from my mind and received my power. From them came all the creatures of this world. 
whoever understands my power and the mystery of my manifestations, comes without doubt to be united with me. I am the source from which all creatures evolve. The wise remember this and worship me with loving devotion. Their thoughts are all absorbed in me, and all their vitality flows to me. Teaching one another, talking about me always, they are happy and fulfilled. To those steadfast in love and devotion, I give spiritual wisdom, so that they may come to me. Out of compassion, I destroy the darkness of their ignorance. From within them, I light the lamp of wisdom and dispel all darkness from their lives. Arjuna, you are Brahman Supreme. The highest abode, the supreme purifier, the divine eternal spirit, first among gods, unborn and infinite. The great sages and seers, Narada, Asita, Devala, and Vyasa, too, have acclaimed you thus. Now you have declared it to me yourself. Now, O Krishna, I believe that everything you have told me is divine truth. O Lord, neither gods nor demons know your real nature. Indeed, you alone know yourself, O Supreme Spirit. You are the source of being and the master of every creature, God of gods, the Lord of the universe. Tell me all your divine attributes, leaving nothing unsaid. Tell me of the glories with which you fill the cosmos. Krishna, you are a supreme master of yoga. Tell me how I should meditate to gain constant awareness of you. In what things and in what ways should I meditate on you? O Krishna, you who stir up people's hearts, tell me in detail your attributes and your powers. I can never tire of hearing your immortal words. Sri Krishna All right, Arjuna, I will tell you of my divine powers. I will mention only the most glorious, for there is no end to them. I am the true self in the heart of every creature, Arjuna, and the beginning, middle, and end of their existence. Among the shining gods I am Vishnu. Of luminaries I am the sun. Among the storm gods I am Mereki, and in the night sky I am the moon. Among scriptures I am the Sama Veda, and among the lesser gods I am Indra. Among the senses I am the mind, and in living beings I am consciousness. Among the Rudras I am Shankara. Among the spirits of the natural world I am Kubera, god of wealth, and the Pavaka, the purifying fire. Among mountains, I am Meru. Among priests, I am Brihaspati. And among military leaders, I am Skanda. Among bodies of water, I am the ocean. Among the great seers, I am Brigu. And among words, the syllable Om. I am the repetition of the holy name. And among mountains, I am the Himalayas. Among trees, I am the Ashvata, the sacred fig. Among the Gandharvas, or heavenly musicians, I am Chitaratha. Among divine seers, I am Narada. And among sages, I am Kapila. I was born from the nectar of immortality 
as the primordial horse and as Indra's noble elephant. Among men I am the king. Among weapons I am the thunderbolt. I am Kamaduk, the cow that fulfills all desires. I am Kandarpa, the power of sex, and Vasuki, the king of snakes. I am Ananta, the cosmic serpent, and Varuna, the god of water. I am Aryaman, among the noble ancestors. Among the forces which restrain, I am Yama, the god of death. Among animals, I am the lion. Among birds, the eagle Garuda. I am Prahlada, born among the demons, and of all that measures, I am time. Among purifying forces, I am the wind. Among warriors, Rama. Of water creatures, I am the crocodile, and of rivers, I am the Ganges. I am the beginning, middle, and end of creation. Of all the sciences, I am the science of self-knowledge, and I am logic in those who debate. Among letters, I am A. Among grammatical compounds, I am the Dvandva. I am infinite time and the sustainer whose face is seen everywhere. I am death, which overcomes all, and the source of all beings still to be born. I am the feminine qualities, fame, beauty, perfect speech, memory, intelligence, Loyalty and forgiveness. Among the hymns of the Samaveda, I am the Brihat. Among poetic meters, the Gayatri. Among months, I am Margashirsha, first of the year. Among seasons, I am spring, that brings forth flowers. I am the gambling of the gambler, and the radiance in all that shines. I am effort, I am victory, and I am the goodness of the virtuous. Among the Vrishnis, I am Krishna, and among the Pandavas, I am Arjuna. Among sages, I am Vyasa, and among poets, Ushanas. I am the scepter which meets out punishment and the art of statesmanship in those who lead. I am the silence of the unknown and the wisdom of the wise. I am the seed that can be found in every creature, Arjuna, for without me nothing can exist, neither animate nor inanimate. But there is no end to my divine attributes, Arjuna. These I have mentioned are only a few. Wherever you find strength, or beauty, or spiritual power, you may be sure that these have sprung from a spark of my essence. But of what use is it to you to know all this, Arjuna? Just remember that I am, and that I support the entire cosmos with only a fragment of my being. Chapter 11. The Cosmic Vision Arjuna out of compassion, you have taught me the supreme mystery of the self. Through your words, my delusion is gone. You have explained the origin and end of every creature, O lotus-eyed one, and told me of your own supreme, limitless existence. Just as you have described your infinite glory, O oh Lord, now I long to see it. I want to see you as the supreme ruler of creation. O oh Lord, master of yoga, 
If you think me strong enough to behold it, show me your immortal self. Sri Krishna Behold, Arjuna, a million divine forms, with an infinite variety of color and shape. Behold the gods of the natural world, and many more wonders never revealed before. Behold the entire cosmos turning within my body, and the other things you desire to see. But these things cannot be seen with your physical eyes. Therefore I give you spiritual vision to perceive my majestic power. Sanjaya Having spoken these words, Krishna, the master of yoga, revealed to Arjuna his exalted, lordly form. He appeared with an infinite number of faces, ornamented by heavenly jewels, displaying unending miracles and the countless weapons of his power. Clothed in celestial garments and covered with garlands, sweet-smelling with heavenly fragrances, he showed himself as the infinite Lord, the source of all wonders, whose face is everywhere. If a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor of that supreme spirit. There, within the body of the God of Gods, Arjuna saw all the manifold forms of the universe united as one. Filled with amazement, his hair standing on end in ecstasy, he bowed before the Lord with joined palms and spoke these words. O Lord, I see within your body all the gods and every kind of living creature. I see Brahma, the creator, seated on a lotus. I see the ancient sages and the celestial serpents. I see infinite mouths and arms, stomachs and eyes, and you are embodied in every form. I see you everywhere, without beginning, middle, or end. You are the Lord of all creation, and the cosmos is your body. You wear a crown and carry a mace and discus. Your radiance is blinding and immeasurable. I see you, who are so difficult to behold, shining like a fiery sun blazing in every direction. You are the supreme, changeless reality, the one thing to be known. You are the refuge of all creation, the immortal spirit, the eternal guardian of eternal dharma. You are without beginning, middle, or end. You touch everything with your infinite power. The sun and moon are your eyes, and your mouth is fire. Your radiance warms the cosmos. O Lord, your presence fills the heavens and the earth and reaches in every direction. I see the three worlds trembling before this vision of your wonderful and terrible form. The gods enter your being, some calling out and greeting you in fear. Great saints, sing your glory, praying may all be well. The multitudes of gods, demigods, and demons are all overwhelmed by the sight of you. O mighty Lord, at the sight of your myriad eyes and mouths, arms and legs, stomachs and fearful teeth, I and the entire universe shake in terror. O Vishnu, I can see your eyes shining. With open mouth, you glitter in an array of colors, and your body touches the sky. I look at you and my heart trembles. I have lost all courage and all peace of mind. When I see your mouths with their fearful teeth, mouths burning 
like fires at the end of time. I forget where I am, and I have no place to go. O oh Lord, you are the support of the universe. Have mercy on me. I see all the sons of Dhritarashtra. I see Bhishma, Drona, and Karna. I see our warriors and all the kings who are here to fight. All are rushing into your awful jaws. I see some of them crushed by your teeth. As rivers flow into the ocean, all the warriors of this world are passing into your fiery jaws. All creatures rush to their destruction like moths into a flame. You lap the worlds into your burning mouths and swallow them. Filled with your terrible radiance, O Vishnu, the whole of creation bursts into flames. Tell me who you are, O Lord of terrible form. I bow before you, have mercy. I want to know who you are, you who existed before all creation. Your nature and workings confound me. Sri Krishna I am time, the destroyer of all. I have come to consume the world. Even with your participation, all the warriors gathered here will die. Therefore arise, Arjuna, conquer your enemies, and enjoy the glory of sovereignty. I have already slain all these warriors. You will only be my instrument. Bhishma Drona, Jayadrat, Karna, and many others are already slain. Kill those whom I have killed. Do not hesitate. Fight in this battle and you will conquer your enemies. Sanjaya Having heard these words, Arjuna trembled in fear. With joined palms he bowed before Krishna and addressed him stammering. O Krishna, it is right that the world delights and rejoices in your praise, that all the saints and sages bow down to you, and all evil flees before you to the far corners of the universe. How could they not worship you, O Lord? You are the eternal spirit who existed before Brahma the Creator, and who will never cease to be. Lord of the gods, you are the abode of the universe. Changeless, you are what is and what is not, and beyond the duality of existence and non-existence. You are the first among the gods, the timeless spirit, the resting place of all beings. You are the knower and the thing which is known. You are the final home, with your infinite form you pervade the cosmos. You are Vayu, god of wind, Yama, god of death. Agni, god of fire, Varuna, god of water. You are the moon and the creator, Prajapati, and the great-grandfather of all creatures. I bow before you and salute you again and again. You are behind me and in front of me. I bow to you on every side. Your power is immeasurable. You pervade everything, you are everything. Sometimes, because we were friends, I rashly said, O oh Krishna, say friend, casual, careless remarks. Whatever I may have said lightly, whether we were playing or resting, alone or in company, sitting together or eating, if it was disrespectful, forgive me for it, O oh Krishna. I did not know the greatness of your nature, unchanging and imperishable. You are the father of the universe, of the animate and the inanimate. You are the object of all worship, the greatest guru. There is none to equal you in the three worlds. Who can match your power? O oh, gracious Lord, I prostrate myself before you and ask for your blessing. As a father forgives his son or a friend a friend, or a lover his beloved, 
so should you forgive me. I rejoice in seeing you as you have never been seen before, yet I am filled with fear by this vision of you as the abode of the universe. Please let me see you again as the shining God of gods. Though you are the embodiment of all creation, let me see you again, not with a thousand arms, but with four, carrying the mace and discus and wearing a crown. Sri Krishna Arjuna, through my grace you have been united with me and received this vision of my radiant universal form without beginning or end, which no one else has ever seen. Not by knowledge of the Vedas, nor sacrifice, nor charity, nor rituals, nor even by severe asceticism has any other mortal seen what you have seen, O heroic Arjuna. Do not be troubled, do not fear my terrible form. Let your heart be satisfied and your fears dispelled in looking at me as I was before. Sanjaya Having spoken these words, the Lord once again assumed the gentle form of Krishna and consoled his devotee, who had been so afraid. Arjuna O Krishna, now that I have seen your gentle human form, my mind is again composed and returned to normal. Sri Krishna It is extremely difficult to obtain the vision you have had. Even the gods long always to see me in this aspect. Neither knowledge of the Vedas, nor austerity, nor charity, nor sacrifice can bring the vision you have seen. But through unfailing devotion, Arjuna, you can know me, see me, and attain union with me. Whoever makes the supreme goal of all his work and acts without selfish attachment, who devotes himself to me completely and is free from ill will for any creature, enters into me. Chapter 12 The Way of Love Arjuna Of those steadfast devotees who love you, and those who seek you as the eternal formless reality, who are the more established in yoga? Sri Krishna Those who set their hearts on me and worship me with unfailing devotion and faith are more established in yoga. As for those who seek the transcendental reality, without name, without form, contemplating the unmanifested, beyond the reach of thought and of feeling, with their senses subdued and mind serene and striving for the good of all beings, they too will verily come to me. Yet hazardous and slow is the path to the unrevealed, difficult for the physical man to tread. But they for whom I am the supreme goal, who do all work renouncing self for me and meditate on me with single-hearted devotion, these I will swiftly rescue from the fragments cycle of birth and death, for their consciousness has entered into me. Still your mind in me, still your intellect in me, and without doubt you will be united with me forever. If you cannot still your mind in me, learn to do so through the regular practice of meditation. If you lack the will for such self-discipline, engage yourself in my work. For selfless service can lead you at last to complete fulfillment. If you are unable to do even this, surrender yourself to me, 
disciplining yourself and renouncing the results of all your actions. Better indeed is knowledge than mechanical practice. Better than knowledge is meditation. But better still is to surrender of attachment to results, because there follows immediate peace. That one I love who is incapable of ill will, who is friendly and compassionate, Living beyond the reach of I and mine, and of pleasure and pain, patient, contented, self-controlled, firm in faith, with all his heart and all his mind given to me, with such a one I am in love. Not agitating the world, or by it agitated, he stands above the sway of elation, competition, and fear. He is my beloved. He is detached, pure, efficient, impartial, never anxious, selfless in all his undertakings. He is my devotee, very dear to me. He is dear to me, who runs not after the pleasant or away from the painful, grieves not, lusts not, but lets things come and go as they happen. That devotee who looks upon friend and foe with equal regard, who is not buoyed up by praise nor cast down by blame. Alike in heat and cold, pleasure and pain, free from selfish attachments, the same in honor and dishonor, quiet, ever full, in harmony everywhere, firm in faith. Such a one is dear to me. Those who meditate upon this immortal dharma as I have declared it, full of faith and seeking me as life's supreme goal, are truly my devotees, and my love for them is very great. Chapter 13 The Field and the Knower Sri Krishna, the body is called a field, Arjuna. He who knows it is called the knower of the field. This is the knowledge of those who know. I am the knower of the field in everyone, Arjuna. Knowledge of the field and its knower is true knowledge. Listen and I will explain the nature of the field and how change takes place within it. I will also describe the knower of the field and his power. These truths have been sung by great sages in a variety of ways, and expounded in precise arguments concerning Brahman. The field, Arjuna, is made up of the following. The five areas of sense perception, the five elements, the five sense organs and the five organs of action, the three components of the mind, manas, buddhi, and ahamkara, and the undifferentiated energy from which all these evolve. In this field arise desire and aversion, pleasure and pain, the body, intelligence, and will. Those who know truly are free from pride and deceit. They are gentle, forgiving, upright, and pure, devoted to their spiritual teacher, filled with inner strength and self-controlled, detached from sense objects and self-will. They have learned the painful lesson of separate birth and suffering, old age, disease, and death. Free from selfish attachment, they do not get compulsively entangled even in home and family. They are even-minded through good fortune and bad. Their devotion to me is undivided. Enjoying solitude and not following the crowd, 
they seek only me. This is true knowledge, to seek the self as the true end of wisdom always. To seek anything else is ignorance. I will tell you of the wisdom that leads to immortality, the beginningless Brahman, which can be called neither being nor non-being. It dwells in all, in every hand and foot and head, in every mouth and eye and ear in the universe. Without senses itself, it shines through the functioning of the senses. Completely independent, it supports all things. Beyond the gunas, it enjoys their play. It is both near and far, both within and without every creature. It moves and is unmoving. In its subtlety, it is beyond comprehension. It is indivisible, yet appears divided in separate creatures. Know it to be the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer. Dwelling in every heart, it is beyond darkness. It is called the light of lights, the object and goal of knowledge, and knowledge itself. I have revealed to you the nature of the field and the meaning and object of true knowledge. Those who are devoted to me, knowing these things, are united with me. Know that Prakriti and Purusha are both without beginning, and that from Prakriti come the gunas and all that change. Prakriti is the agent, cause, and effect of every action, but is Purusha that seems to experience pleasure and pain. Purusha, resting in Prakriti, witnesses the play of the gunas born of Prakriti. But attachment to the gunas leads a person to be born for good or evil. Within the body, the supreme Purusha is called the witness, approver, supporter, enjoyer, the supreme lord, the highest self. Whoever realizes the true nature of Purusha, Prakriti, and the gunas, whatever path he or she may follow, is not born separate again. Some realize the self within them through the practice of meditation, some by the path of wisdom, and others by selfless service. Others may not know these paths, but hearing and following the instructions of an illumined teacher, they too go beyond death. Whatever exists, Arjuna, animate or inanimate, is born through the union of the field and its knower. He alone sees truly who sees the Lord the same in every creature, who sees the deathless in the hearts of all that die. Seeing the same Lord everywhere, he does not harm himself or others. Thus he attains the supreme goal. They alone see truly, who see that all actions are performed by Prakriti, while the self remains unmoved. When they see the variety of creation rooted in the unity and growing out of it, they attain fulfillment in Brahman. This supreme self is without a beginning, undifferentiated, deathless. Though it dwells in the body, Arjuna, it neither acts nor is touched by action. As Akasha pervades the cosmos but remains unstained, the self can never be tainted, though it dwells in every creature. As the sun lights up the world, the self dwelling in the field is the source of all light in the field. Those who, with the eye of wisdom, distinguish the field from its knower and the way to freedom from the bondage of Prakriti, attain the supreme goal. I don't need Chapter 14. 
the forces of evolution. Sri Krishna Let me tell you more about the wisdom that transcends all knowledge, through which the saints and sages attained perfection. Those who rely on this wisdom will be united with me. For them there is neither rebirth nor fear of death. My womb is Prakriti, in that I place the seed. Thus all created things are born. Everything born, Arjuna, comes from the womb of Prakriti, and I am the seed-giving father. It is in the three gunas born of Prakriti, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, that bind the immortal self to the body. Sattva, pure, luminous, and free from sorrow, binds us with attachment to happiness and wisdom. Rajas is passion, arising from selfish desire and attachment. These bind the self with compulsive action. Tamas, born of ignorance, deludes all creatures through heedlessness, indolence, and sleep. Sattva binds us to happiness, Rajas binds us to action. Tamas, distorting our understanding, binds us to delusion. Sattva predominates when Rajas and Tamas are transformed. Rajas prevails when Sattva is weak and Tamas overcome. Tamas prevails when Rajas and Sattva are dormant. When Sattva predominates, the light of wisdom shines through every gate of the body. When Rajas predominates, a person runs about pursuing selfish and greedy ends, driven by restlessness and desire. When Tamas is dormant, a person lives in darkness, slothful, confused, and easily infatuated. Those dying in the state of sattva attain the pure worlds of the wise. Those dying in rajas are reborn among people driven by work. But those who die in tamas are conceived in the wombs of the ignorant. The fruit of good deeds is pure and sattvic. The fruit of rajas is suffering. The fruit of tamas is ignorance and insensitivity. From sattva comes understanding, from rajas greed. But the outcome of tamas is confusion, infatuation, and ignorance. Those who live in sattva go upwards. Those in rajas remain where they are. But those immersed in tamas sink downwards. The wise see clearly that all action is the work of the gunas. Knowing that which is above the gunas, they enter into union with me. Going beyond the three gunas which form the body, they leave behind the circle of birth and death, decrepitude and sorrow, and attain to immortality. Arjuna, what are the characteristics of those who have gone beyond the gunas, O Lord? How do they act? How have they passed beyond the gunas hold? Sri Krishna, they are unmoved by the harmony of sattva, the activity of rajas, or the delusion of tamas. They feel no aversion when these forces are active, nor do they crave for them when these forces subside. They remain impartial, undisturbed by the actions of the gunas. Knowing that it is the gunas which act, they abide within themselves and do not vacillate. Established within themselves, they are equal in pleasure and pain, praise and blame, kindness and unkindness. Clay, a rock, and gold are the same to them. Alike in honor and dishonor, alike to friend and foe, they have given up every selfish pursuit. Such are those who have gone beyond the gunas. By serving me with steadfast love, a man or woman goes beyond the gunas. 
such a one is fit for union with Brahman. For I am the support of Brahman, the eternal, the unchanging, the deathless, the everlasting Dharma, the source of all joy. Chapter 15. The Supreme Self As Sri Krishna, sages speak of the immutable Ashvat tree, with its taproot above and its branches below. On this tree grow the scriptures, Seeing their source, one knows their essence. Nourished by the gunas, the limbs of this tree spread above and below. Sense objects grow on the limbs as buds. The roots hanging down bind us to action in this world. The true form of this tree, its essence beginning and end, is not perceived on this earth. Cut down this strong-rooted tree with the sharp axe of detachment. Then find the path which does not come back again. Seek that, the first cause, from which the universe came long ago. Not deluded by pride, free from selfish attachment and selfish desire, beyond the duality of pleasure and pain, ever aware of the self, the wise go forward to that eternal goal. Neither the sun nor the moon nor fire can add to that light. This is my supreme abode, and those who enter there do not return to separate existence. An eternal part of me enters into the world, assuming the powers of action and perception and a mind made of prakriti. When the divine self enters and leaves a body, it takes these along as the wind carries a scent from place to place. Using the mind, ears, eyes, and nose, and the senses of taste and touch, the self enjoys sense objects. The deluded do not see the self when it leaves the body or when it dwells within it. They do not see the self enjoying sense objects or acting through the gunas. But they who have the eye of wisdom see. Those who strive resolutely on the path of yoga see the self within. The thoughtless who strive imperfectly do not. The brightness of the sun which lights up the world The brightness of the moon and of fire, these are my glory. With a drop of my energy, I enter the earth and support all creatures. Through the moon, the vessel of life-giving fluid, I nourish all plants. I enter breathing creatures and dwell within as the life-giving breath. I am the fire in the stomach which digests all food. Entering into every heart, I give the power to remember and understand. It is I again who take that power away. All the scriptures lead it to me. I am their author and their wisdom. In this world, there are two orders of being, the perishable, separate creature, and the changeless spirit. But beyond these there is another, the Supreme Self, the Eternal Lord, who enters into the entire cosmos and supports it from within. I am that Supreme Self, praised by the scriptures as beyond the changing and the changeless. Those who see in me that Supreme Self see truly. They have found the source of all wisdom, Arjuna and they worship me with all their heart. I have shared this profound truth with you, Arjuna. Those who understand it will attain wisdom. They will have done that which has to be done. Chapter 16 Two Paths Sri Krishna Be fearless and pure, Never waver in your determination or your dedication to the spiritual life. 
Give freely. Be self-controlled, sincere, truthful, loving, and full of the desire to serve. Realize the truth of the scriptures. Learn to be detached and to take joy in renunciation. Do not get angry or harm any living creature, but be compassionate and gentle. Show good will to all. Cultivate vigor, patience, will, purity. Avoid malice and pride. Then, Arjuna, you will achieve your divine destiny. Other qualities, Arjuna, make a person more and more inhuman. Hypocrisy, arrogance, conceit, anger, cruelty, ignorance. The divine qualities lead to freedom, the demonic to bondage. But do not grieve, Arjuna. You were born with divine attributes. Some people have divine tendencies, others demonic. I have described the divine at length, Arjuna. Now listen while I describe the demonic. The demonic do things they should avoid and avoid the things they should do. They have no sense of uprightness, purity, or truth. There is no God, they say, no truth, no spiritual law, no moral order. The basis of life is sex. What else can it be? Holding such distorted views, possessing scant discrimination, they become enemies of the world, causing suffering and destruction. Hypocritical, proud, and arrogant, living in delusion and clinging to deluded ideas, insatiable in their desires, they pursue their unclean ends. Although burdened with fears that end only with death, they still maintain with complete assurance. Gratification of lust is the highest that life can offer. Bound on all sides by scheming and anxiety, driven by anger and greed, they amass by any means they can a hoard of money for the satisfaction of their cravings. I got this today, they say, tomorrow I shall get that. This wealth is mine and that will be mine too. I have destroyed my enemies, I shall destroy others too. Am I not like God? I enjoy what I want. I am successful. I am powerful. I am happy. I am rich and well-born. Who is equal to me? I will perform sacrifices and give gifts, and rejoice in my own generosity. This is how they go on, deluded by ignorance, bound by their greed and entangled in a web of delusion, whirled about by a fragmented mind, they fall into a dark hell. Self-important, obstinate, swept away by the pride of wealth, they ostentatiously perform sacrifices without any regard for their purpose. Egotistical, violent, arrogant, lustful, angry, envious of everyone, they abuse my presence within their own bodies and in the bodies of others. Life after life, I cast those who are malicious, hateful, cruel, and degraded into the wombs of those with similar demonic natures. Birth after birth, they find themselves with demonic tendencies. Degraded in this way, Arjuna, they fail to reach me and fall lower still. There are three gates to this self-destructive hell, lust, anger, and greed. Renounce these three. Those who escape from these three gates of darkness, Arjuna, seek what is best and attain life's supreme goal. Others disregard the teachings of the scriptures. Driven by selfish desire, they miss the goal of life, miss even happiness and success. Therefore, let the scriptures be your guide in what to do and what not to do. Understand their teachings, then act in accordance with them. Chapter 17. The Power of Faith Arjuna O oh Krishna, what is the state of those who disregard the scriptures but still worship with faith? Do they act from sattva, rajas, or tamas? Sri Krishna Every creature is born with faith of some kind, either sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. Listen, and I will describe each to you. 
Our faith conforms to our nature, Arjuna. Human nature is made of faith. Indeed, a person is his faith. Those who are sattvic worship the forms of God. Those who are rajasic worship power and wealth. Those who are tamasic worship spirits and ghosts. Some invent harsh penances. Motivated by hypocrisy and egotism, they torture their innocent bodies and me who dwells within. Blinded by their strength and passion, they act and think like demons. The three kinds of faith express themselves in the habits of those who hold them. In the food they like, the work they do, the disciplines they practice, the gifts they give. Listen, and I will describe their different ways. Sattvic people enjoy food that is mild, tasty, substantial, agreeable, and nourishing. Food that promotes health, strength, cheerfulness, and longevity. Rajasic people like food that is salty or bitter, hot, sour, or spicy. Food that promotes pain, discomfort, and dis-ease. Tamasic people like overcooked, stale, leftover, and impure food. Food that has lost its taste and nutritional value. The sattvic perform sacrifices with their entire mind fixed on the purpose of the sacrifice. Without thought of reward, they follow the teachings of the scriptures. The Rajasic perform sacrifices for the sake of show and the good it will bring them. The Tamasic perform sacrifices ignoring both the letter and the spirit. They omit the proper prayers, the proper offerings, the proper food, and the proper faith. To offer service to the gods, to the good, to the wise, and to your spiritual teacher. Purity, honesty, continence, and nonviolence, these are the disciplines of the body. To offer soothing words, to speak truly, kindly, and helpfully, and to study the scriptures, these are the disciplines of speech. Calmness, gentleness, silence, self-restraint, and purity, these are the disciplines of the mind. When these three levels of self-discipline are practiced without attachment to the results, but in a spirit of great faith, the sages call this practice sattvic. Disciplines practiced in order to gain respect, honor, or admiration are rajasic. They are undependable and transitory in their effects. Disciplines practiced to gain power over others or in the confused belief that to torture oneself is spiritual are tamasic. Giving simply because it is right to give, without thought of return, at a proper time, in proper circumstances, and to a worthy person, is sattvic giving. Giving with regrets or in the expectation of receiving some favor or of getting Something in return is rajasic. Giving at an inappropriate time, in inappropriate circumstances, and to an unworthy person, without affection or respect, is tamasic. Om Tat Sat These three words represent Brahman, from which come priests and scriptures and sacrifice. Those who follow the Vedas, therefore, always repeat the word Om when offering sacrifices, performing spiritual disciplines, or giving gifts. Those seeking liberation and not any personal benefit add the word Tat when performing these acts of worship, discipline, and charity. Sat means that which is. It also indicates goodness. Therefore, it is used to describe a worthy deed. To be steadfast in self-sacrifice, self-discipline, and giving is sat. To act in accordance with these three is sat as well. 
But to engage in sacrifice, self-discipline, and giving without good faith is asat, without worth or goodness, either in this life or in the next. Chapter 18. Freedom and Renunciation Arjuna O Krishna, destroyer of evil, please explain to me sannyasa and tiaga, and how one kind of renunciation differs from another. A sattvic worker is free from egotism and selfish attachments, full of enthusiasm and fortitude in success and failure alike. A rajisic worker has strong personal desires and craves rewards for his actions. Covetous, impure, and destructive, he is easily swept away by fortune, good or bad. The tamasic worker is undisciplined, vulgar, stubborn, deceitful, dishonest, and lazy. He is easily depressed and prone to procrastination. Listen, Arjuna, as I describe the three types of understanding and will. To know when to act and when to refrain from action. What is right action and what is wrong? What brings security and what insecurity? What brings freedom and what bondage? These are the signs of a sattvic intellect. The rajasic intellect confuses right and wrong actions and cannot distinguish what is to be done from what should not be done. The tamasic intellect is shrouded in darkness, utterly reversing right and wrong wherever it turns. The sattvic will, developed through meditation, keeps prana, mind, and senses in vital harmony. For the rajasic will, conditioned by selfish desire, pursues wealth, pleasure, and respectability. The tamasic will shows itself in obstinate ignorance, sloth, fear, grief, depression, and conceit. Now listen, Arjuna, there are also three kinds of happiness. By sustained effort, one comes to the end of sorrow. That which seems like poison at first, but tastes like nectar in the end. This is the joy of sattva, born of a mind at peace with itself. Pleasure from the senses seems like nectar at first, but it is bitter as poison in the end. This is the kind of happiness that comes to the rajasic. Those who are tamasic draw their pleasures from sleep, indolence, and intoxication. Both in the beginning and in the end, this happiness is a delusion. No creature, whether born on earth or among the gods in heaven, is free from the conditioning of the three gunas. The different responsibilities found in the social order, distinguishing Brahmin, Kshaitriya, Vaishya, and Shudra, have their roots in this conditioning. The responsibilities to which a Brahmin is born based on his nature are self-control, tranquility, purity of heart, patience, humility, learning, austerity, wisdom, and faith. The qualities of a Kshatriya, based on his nature, are courage, strength, fortitude, dexterity, generosity, leadership, and the firm resolve never to retreat from battle. The occupations suitable for a Vaishya are agriculture, dairying, and trade. The proper work of a Shudra is service. By devotion to one's own particular duty, everyone can attain perfection. Let me tell you how. By performing his own work, one worships the Creator who dwells in every creature. Such worship brings that person to fulfillment. It is better to perform one's own duties imperfectly than to master the duties of another. By fulfilling the obligations he is born with, a person never comes to grief. 
No one should abandon duties because he sees defects in them. Every action, every activity is surrounded by defects as a fire is surrounded by smoke. He who is free from selfish attachments, who has mastered himself and his passions, attains the supreme perfection of freedom from action. Listen, and I shall explain now, Arjuna, how one who has attained perfection also attains Brahman, the supreme consummation of wisdom. Unerring in his discrimination, sovereign of his senses and passions, Free from the clamor of likes and dislikes, he leads a simple, self-reliant life based on meditation, controlling his speech, body, and mind. Free from self-will aggressiveness, arrogance, anger, and the lust to possess people or things, he is at peace with himself and others and enters into the unitive state. United with Brahman, Ever joyful beyond the reach of desire and sorrow, he has equal regard for every living creature and attains supreme devotion to me. By loving me, he comes to know me truly. Then he knows my glory and enters into my boundless being. All his acts are performed in my service, and through my grace he wins eternal life. Make every act an offering to me. Regard me as your only protector. Relying on interior discipline, meditate on me always. Remembering me, you shall overcome all difficulties through my grace. But if you will not heed me in your self-will, nothing will avail you. If you egotistically say, I will not fight this battle, your resolve will be useless. Your own nature will drive you into it. Your own karma, born of your own nature, will drive you to do even that which you do not wish to do because of your delusion. The Lord dwells in the hearts of all creatures and whirls them round upon the wheel of Maya. Run to him for refuge with all your strength, and peace profound will be yours through his grace. I give you these precious words of wisdom, Reflect on them and then do as you choose. These are the last words I shall speak to you, dear one, for your spiritual fulfillment. You are very dear to me. Be aware of me always, adore me, make every act an offering to me, and you shall come to me. This I promise, for you are dear to me. Abandon all supports and look to me for protection. I shall purify you from the sins of the past. Do not grieve. Do not share this wisdom with anyone who lacks in devotion or self-control, lacks the desire to learn, or scoffs at me. Those who teach this supreme mystery of the Gita to all who love me perform the greatest act of love. They will come to me without doubt. No one can render me more devoted service. No one on earth can be more dear to me. Those who meditate on these holy words worship me with wisdom and devotion. Even those who listen to them with faith, free from doubts, will find a happier world where good people dwell. Have you listened with attention? Are you now free from your doubts and confusion? Arjuna, you have dispelled my doubts and delusions, and I understand through your grace. My faith is firm now, and I will do your will. Sanjaya, this is the dialogue I heard between Krishna, the son of Vasudeva, and Arjuna, the great-hearted son of Pritha. The wonder of it makes my hair stand on end. Through Vyasa's grace, I have heard the supreme secret of spiritual union directly from the Lord of Yoga, Krishna himself. Whenever I remember these wonderful holy words between Krishna and Arjuna, I am filled with joy, and when I remember the breathtaking form of Krishna, 
I am filled with wonder and my joy overflows. Wherever the divine Krishna and the mighty Arjuna are, there will be prosperity, victory, happiness, and sound judgment. Of this I am sure. 